We have all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richardelli, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome to The Converging Zone. We're back with our guest, Edwin Black, author, researcher, speaker. Welcome back, Edwin Black. Thank you. The man much. in black. Thank you very I think much, I asked Robert. you if you were a, a Johnny Cash fan, but yeah. you do look good in black. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> good to have you. Thank you, you know, for having me again. Well, I love it. Okay. And then we're going to go out to dinner again tonight. That's what's really exciting. Hey, we're going to talk today about this book. One of Edwin's 10 books is The Far Hood. And, you know, Edwin, as we were looking at this, I don't know if most people know this, but the Jewish people were in the Middle East well over a thousand years before Muhammad. And so tell us about this and, the, and what happened when the Jewish people encountered Islam or more like when Islam encountered the Jewish people during that time. Well, the book, The Far Hood, which means violent dispossession in, Ar in, Ar in Ar Arabic, traces uh, the roots of the Arab Nazi alliance in the Holocaust. It was a vast, robust, and incredibly violent and vicious Arab Nazi alliance in the Holocaust that resulted in a two-day pogrom in Baghdad in 1941, um, which uh, was designed to exterminate uh, all the Jews of Iraq. So your question is, uh, is it not true that the Jews were in the Middle East a thousand years before Islam? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, the Jews uh, predate uh, um, Islam by a millennium, a thousand years, and they really encounter uh, the uh, uh, Muhammad in 627 uh, in, uh, in Medina. Now, you've heard of Mecca and you've heard of Medina, yeah. but what you probably don't know and what your listeners probably don't know is that the word Medina is Hebrew, is a Hebrew derivative for the word city, Medinat, or, or district, and that Medina was a largely Jewish city. So what happened in 627, uh, Muhammad, with his new religion, uh, just a few years old, told the Jews of Medina they had to convert. They refused to convert, and so uh, he and his followers had them lined up uh, in the public square and beheaded one by one with all their whole heads rolling in, uh, in the gutter, uh, took the women, and um, then proceeded north, uh, sweeping through the Arabian Peninsula in what, is, what historians know as the Islamic conquest, and um, uh, converted everyone in their way, or turned them into uh, demis. Now, it's important to understand that the topic that we're going to be talking about here, this Arab Nazi alliance, and the roots of this collusion, is very sensitive. And we're talking history. So people must take it as history as they would take any information about Germans in World War II or Italians in World War II. And just try to keep it in its historical con context and not try to uh, apply it inappropriately to their, to their neighbors, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the Islamic conquest uh, takes over the Middle East, uh, North Africa, parts of uh, Europe, and, uh, and Eurasia, and uh, of course, at about 700, approximately, the Pact of Umar declares that uh, Christians and Jews, who are considered people of the book, are an inferior people, and that they must be dhimmis, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, which means a second or third class citizen, one who is not allowed to practice their religion freely and um, pay special taxes, uh, uh, ride donkeys when uh, Arabs would ride horses. They would sometimes have to wear a yellow star to, uh, I, uh, to identify themselves, a funny hat. Uh, sometimes they'd have to wear colored uh, outfits. And uh, whether or not Jews would be horribly persecuted or exalted as a special class really depended upon 
the era and the dynasty and the region. So you can't really uh, generalize and say that Jews were always persecuted. In some periods, Jews lived very well in the Arab world. Uh, they were people of means, even of nobility. But whether or not Jews were massacred or exalted was within the context of dimitude, which means they were given permission. And it is the concept of equality, living side by side with Jews as equals, that violated the entire concept of the Quranic relationship to Jews. Now, why do I bring up this Medina extermination? It, there is equally horrible um, uh, episodes in the uh, Jewish Bible, in the Christian Bible, in all the holy books. But in this case, the Muslims created this as an iconic moment. That means for the Jews, it might be the parting of the Red Sea, and for the uh, Christians, it might be the Sermon on the Mount. And the Muslims self-created this and repeated the story over and over again to themselves, to their enemies, to their friends, in their media, and face to face to Adolf Hitler in his office during the Holocaust, explaining to him, this is the way you handle the Jews. You know, you talk about this uh, Arab-German alliance, and I just learned earlier today from you, um, many of us, and I talked to a few folks, were told that when you talk about anti-Semitism, you're talking about anti-Jew. When it's the Semitic race is the, whole, is the whole Arabic and the whole Middle Eastern area. Explain to me this whole Semitic race and who's included and who's not included. Noah had three sons. One of them was Shem. Okay. The descendants of Shem are Shemites, also known as Semites. Okay. One of these was Abraham. Abraham was not a Jew. He was not a Christian. He was a patriarch. He was the father of many nations. And among the nations that he was the father of was the father of the Arabs and the father of the Jews. Mm -hmm. They were all Semites within, within the Nazi context of racial structuring, where there was the inferior races, the uh, uh, middle races, and the higher races, such as the Aryan race, at the bottom of the pit were the Semites, whether it was Arabs or whether it was Jews. And so you might ask, what was it that made the Arabs want to uh, find common cause and partnership with the, uh, um, what was it that made the Germans find partnership with the Semites, the Arabs? And the answer is the one ingredient that always binds evil in our history, oil. Mm. The Arabs had it. The Nazis wanted it. Wow. So, so it, it came down to that, again, money, power, or resources. Well, the Nazis needed to cross into Russia to invade Russia. They needed the Middle East oil, oil which was controlled by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. That's a British oil company. And they controlled all the oil of Iran, of Iraq, of many other parts of, of the Middle East, and that company is now known today as British Petroleum. And British Petroleum was actually central to creating all the boundaries and country lines and national frontiers in the Middle East along the lines of the oil contracts and the pipelines that they hoped to uh, construct to convey the oil according to those, agree uh, to those agreements. Explain further what actually happened, what took place in 1941. Well, so many Jews were coming into Palestine during the Hitler regime because Palestine was set up as a, um, uh, as a Jewish and an Arab homeland. Now, let's go back in time. You do remember that Israel was uh, uh, established before Roman times, but when the Romans came in, uh, they expelled the Jews after the Jewish revolt, and uh, they renamed uh, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Palestina, uh, meaning uh, uh, the southern part of Syria, to forever erase the name of the Jews in their own homeland of Israel. So the Jews were all pushed out. As an example here, 
of how, in some cases, the Jews were helped by the Muslims of the uh, uh, ancient world in 1492, when the king of Spain, on behalf of the Catholic Church, expelled the Jews from uh, Spain for the Inquisition, it was uh, the sultan who um, uh, gave um, uh, help and rescue to all the Jews, or many of the Jews, who were expelled in 1492, and said to, to the uh, king of Spain, uh, what a fool you are to get rid of the Jews. And he welcomed the uh, Muslim sultan uh, welcome the Jews into the Ottoman Empire, which of course was run by Turkey, which controlled all the land of the Middle East for approximately 500 years. He welcomed them in, and he welcomed them in, not as slaves, not to toil, not to bring uh, large stones up a hill. He, he brought them in to thrive. He brought them in to be businessmen, to bring their scientific knowledge, their academic skills. And so that's a perfect example how it's important not to generalize about whether Jews were, mis were mistreated or well treated during their years in Muslim lands. But it does not change the fact that once Jews escaped from dimitude and into equality, it violated every Quranic concept of relation to the Jews. Now when did that happen? That happened after World War I. Because after World War I, uh, the, the uh, Ottoman Turks had sided with the Germans in World War I, and in consequence, when Germany lost the war, Turkey lost the war. Turkey lost all of its colonies in the Middle East, including those in Palestine. And the League of Nations carved all of this up to create a better world. In the process, they gave national rights to minorities who were attempting to achieve self-determination. Now what is self-determination? At the end of the 19th century, that's the 1900s, uh, there, it uh, signaled the uh, fall and recession of the ecclesiastical, dynastic, and monarchical regimes. People wanted to self-identify. People wanted to self-determine, determine their own futures. Whether they spoke a common language, had a common religion, uh, had a common uh, ancestry, had a geographic location, whether they were Armenians, Hungarians, Arabs, or Jews. So, in the case of the Jews, the Jews wanted to return to their uh, ancestors' home, which was Israel, which always had a Jewish uh, minority in Jerusalem going back and never ending, even from Roman times to modern times. And that meant that the Arabs and the Jews would be living side by side because when the Balfour Declaration of the, ki of the King of Eng England uh, expressed through his foreign minister, Balfour, said, we welcome the Jews to return to their homeland. And this was echoed by Woodrow Wilson in America, by the French government, even by the German government and the Turkish government, which owned the property. And when the Jews were then coming in, it meant that the Arabs had to live side by side with Jews living in square houses, Jews with electricity, Jews with machinery, modernity. And this was completely alien. And more than that, many of these Jews were no longer the Jews of Morocco and the Jews of Turkey and the Jews of Syria. They were now the Jews of Poland and Germany and Austria, especially foreign, more foreign than any other Jew. And these Jews coming in thought, okay, we're going to live free and practice our religion. And of course, the Arabs said, you cannot practice your religion free. What's interesting is that this all came to a head at the Western Wall. You know, the, uh, uh, the Wailing Wall, yeah. that giant wall which is the holiest site in all of Jewry. The Jews in 1928 said, it's hot, it's Yom Kippur, which is our holy day. We have to stand all, all, all day in many cases. We have to pray all, all day without food. At some point, we want to sit down. And when they tried to sit down, the Arabs warned them, don't do that again. Do not sit down at the Wailing Wall. Jews were not permitted to sit when they prayed at the Wailing Wall. Now, why is that? 
because that wall that most of your viewers know as the holiest part of Jewish tradition, that wall is also holy to Muslims. Mm. It is called Al-Barak. Let me explain. When Muhammad flew from Mecca on his winged white horse to the seventh heaven, he tethered his horse at the furthest mosque. That's the mosque most far away from Mecca. The furthest means Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa Mosque, the furthest mosque, right in Jerusalem, where they had the least number of Jews, because as we know, uh, Jerusalem was never part of the Quranic tradition. It's never mentioned in the Quran. Uh, it is uh, mentioned hundreds of times in the Jewish and the Christian Bible. And of course, originally, before Medina, uh, uh, Muhammad prayed toward Jerusalem. And then after he saw the resistance of the Jews to the new religion, uh, turned his back to Jerusalem and prayed to Mecca. So he was facing Mecca, and the other side was facing Jerusalem. So because Muhammad, on his white-winged horse, tethered his horse at this wall, that made this wall sacred to Muslims. And as a result, if Jews sat there, it seemed to bestow some form of autonomy or ownership of the wall or step-by-step uh, -step liberation or whatever you want to say. And so they then said, never sit there again. The next year, 1929, the Jews again, during a Jewish holiday, said, we're here, we're uh, free, we're living in a in a Jewish homeland established by the League of Nations, established under international law, both individually by the leading uh, uh, powers of the world and the entire international community. We've got to be allowed to sit when we uh, pray if we want to. And at that point, um, the uh, British police began pulling the chairs out from under these little old ladies trying to sit because the British police were charged with the impossible task of enabling Jewish self-determination in Palestine, but maintaining the status quo of the Muslim religion, which under Sharia said that Jews may not sit. And so a riot broke out where uh, the, the uh, Jewish notes in the wall were burned and um, Jews were beaten down with um, uh, uh, rifle butts, and uh, the, um, uh, the mortuarians and the medical examiners said it was the worst post-mortuarial skull fractures they had ever seen, even after World, World War I. And then the Mufti of Jerusalem, the guy who's in this famous picture, this is the, this is the leader of the uh, Arab community, and ultimately became the leader of the entire Muslim community during World War II. He told the British, quick, go down to the old city and save the Jews. So when the police went down there, the main band of marauders went up to Hebron and slaughtered the uh, defenseless Bible study people in that town. Scores of them were killed and they weren't just killed. They weren't just murdered. They were murdered in accordance with their identity. That means the baker was baked in his own oven. The scholar had his head cut open and his, his uh, brain was played with uh, like, a, um, like a football. Um, a traveler uh, was crucified against a door. And it would have been worse, but many righteous Muslims' neighbors pulled themselves in front of the mob and, and, and protected their, their neighbors. And finally, the British found out what was going on and brought in uh, uh, machine gun equipped aircraft to clear the streets. And it became worse and worse. And the British government said, we will um, make two states, one for the Arabs, and one for the Jews, it's obvious they cannot live, to, live together. At that point, the Mufti of Jerusalem escaped, to, uh, escaped arrest into Iraq. 
and formed a cabal with other Arab Nazi fascists. And when I mean Arab Nazis who actually saluted Hitler, marched in the Nuremberg torchlight par parades. And on June 1st, 1941, uh, they were scheduled to massacre all the Jews of Baghdad. They had put their red palm print on every doorpost, kind of like an inversion of the uh, Passover story. And um, uh, the mayor of Baghdad got wind of it. And as a favor to the Jews and to help the Jews, expelled the Mufti and his cabal of lieutenants. And then in the power vacuum of just hours, a monstrous pogrom broke out. Uh, the army, uh, the uh, mobs, the criminals, the police all together marauding through the streets, cutting babies in half, raping children in front of their parents, killing parents in front of their children, throwing infants into the Tigris, breaking down the doors of the Jewish uh, uh, homes, chasing the people up to their roofs. Uh, the people would run up to the roof, they'd barricade the door. They'd run from rooftop to rooftop, trying to escape the marauders, and when they ran out of roofs, they threw their children down to someone waiting to, to catch them. I spoke to people just a few days ago in uh, Las Vegas who actually lived through that experience. Every, um, uh, every Oriental Jew, that means every Jew from an Arab land, knows these stories. Most of the community does not, but every Iraqi Jew and every Jew from the Arab tradition knows these stories. And when Qam was finally restored by the British, then the Mufti went to Adolf Hitler, had this famous meeting, yeah. and then the real alliance came to the fore. What happened after World War II? What well, before World War II ends, the Mufti of Jerusalem makes a deal, an open deal, and this is from newsreel footage, that he will assist the Nazis in exchange for the destruction of the Jews and the creation of, a, of, of, of an Arab state. And so three Waffen-SS divisions are created. Uh, the Hanshar, the Kama, and the Skanderbeg. The division has about 10,000 guys in it. Volunteer Muslims who operated from Paris to Palestine, mainly in Yugoslavia, but also in Poland, and they were doing everything that every other uh, division would do. They were paratroopers, they were saboteurs, they were infantrymen, they were artillery specialists, and they also helped form the most violent, uh, extremist, and bloodthirsty militia in the Holocaust, a, a, a magnitude worse than Auschwitz. They formed the Ustashi, which together with, uh, with Catholics uh, uh, began to uh, wreak the worst devastation on Greek Orthodox Jews, uh, disobedient Muslims, and everyone else. Uh, at one point they had a test, uh, a contest, to see how many throats could be cut in one night. And uh, one guy cut 350 throats, and one guy had 650 throats. And the winner of this contest in this one concentration camp called Jasenovac uh, uh, um, cut 1,350 throats. And so um, finally, when World War II uh, came to a close in May of 1945, we can say that the war against the Jews uh, ended in Europe, but then it continued in the Middle East. Because to answer your question, Many, about 2,000 of the Gestapo agents, SS, concentration camp guards, uh, in, intelligence, escaped from Nazi Germany by, uh, by the Odessa plan and by other uh, um, uh, rescue routes into the Arab lands, took up positions in the Egyptian and Syrian military, intelligence, police, 
and ultimately helped formulate the armies and the strategies to finish the job when Israel was granted independence and declared independence. And when the six armies surrounded Israel, they didn't say it is, a, uh, it is a war to liberate our lands. They said it's a war of extermination. We will finish the job. But they didn't finish the job. And it is those people, it is that generation that gave us the current generation, which is how we got to the Middle East. In fact, the most popular name for children in, 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 in the Muslim world was Hitler. Wow. The General Tantawi, field marshal in Egypt, just relieved of command, had two brothers, Benito and Hitler. You can even go to Google and type Hitler Tantawi and you find the famous general. It's a sad story, but it helps explain. And so you may say, what is the hope in what you say? There is hope. Because even though there's no chance for peace in the Middle East, because no, you cannot suddenly overturn 1,400 years, there is a chance for peaceful coexistence. And a generation of peaceful coexistence can lead to another generation of genuine peace and then a third generation of true fellowship. Do you know what the Israeli uh, national anthem is called? No. It's called Hatikva. Do you know what it means? No. Hope. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You know, real quick, with where we're at today in the world, and what, what, what are you seeing in the headlines now? I mean, we're going to talk briefly in, a, in another segment around what's going on today, but uh, regarding this whole thing, is what is going on in the headlines right now? Right now, uh, Hamas in Gaza uh, has been committing war crimes for uh, uh, several years. Uh, specifically, they're launching uh, rockets um, into civilian areas. And as a result of launching rockets into civilian areas, sometimes 200 at a time, imagine being in your city and seeing 200 rockets come in. Uh, Israel finally has gone in to wipe out some of those rockets and to uh, uh, decapitate the leadership and to try to put a stop to it. You know, we're going to come back. We're actually going to do a, a little segment on this, on what's going on right now uh, as of today. And you're going to hear some things you may not hear in the, in, in the regular news. And my friend Edwin Black is in the know of uh, what's going on over there. Edwin, thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you for having me, Robert. Thanks for being with us on the Converging Zone, and we'll see you back soon.